Okay, thank you very much for waiting. So now we are there. I hope everyone can see and hear me. Seeing is not that relevant as long as you see the slides. So I need to develop new enforcement techniques because slowly class is getting fuller again. So unfortunately, and I looked at it, I'm not allowed to throw with tomatoes uh, anyone. So that's not going to happen. So I need to hope for your compliance nevertheless. Um, but that seems to have happened. So welcome back, everyone. Good to see you again. It's quite refreshing sometimes to be in a classroom environment, not always behind your own screen. A um, few things. Um, last Friday, out on Olympia, I think the deadline for the reviews expired, right? What reviews? What deadline? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> um no i think that worked quite well because uh, i'd seen um i think most of you actually did reviews like the there's just outliers i mean pretty much everyone did it um so on average is quite nice uh it seems we have about 2.6 sure that pans out 2.6 reviews per submission so that's pretty cool uh you know two was the the, the goal at least the minimum of uh, expectation in any case so that's really cool so what our job well now will be i think the first ones have wondered okay what's happening now I want to learn more about what went well, what went wrong, and so on. There's two aspects to it. Um, what uh, and this is the beautiful part about the learning. So, in first instance, I would encourage you to just you know check on your own submission to see because you can see reviews, right? Good. And indicate if you are have see issues with those, right? So because there's always that perspective as well that people may oversee uh, or wrongly judge your system or whatever else, or make you offer your own observations you haven't thought about. Sure, they have you know, been observed in your system, but it's a good learning there that you directly have. But also, if there's something you're uneasy about, you feel that's the wrong observation, that's perfectly fine. It happens to everyone, it happens to us as well. If I do marking, guess what? After the, you know, 56 submission that I'm looking at, I'm probably getting slightly inconsistent in my approach as well, even though I try to have a proper schedule laid out. And in fact, what I'm emulating here in terms of the assessment, the review form, that is possibly like the schedule that I would make for myself for the assessment, right? Um, it's just that now we, we have distributed it and you kind of see on the one hand how, you know, an evaluation can probably look like by lecture, you're looking behind the scenes, but also perform yourself. And then you mentioned last time you learn something from it, you see other approaches, or you, you know, also look at other people say, hey, guys, you really should have, you know, be able to solve this. But then it's your task, that's a tough one, to write construct feedback. Right, not just what the heck is going on here, because uh, we, I mean, part of our discipline is very uh, susceptible to being a bit uh, opinionated. I'm not sure if anyone has uh, remotely looked into uh, the wrong forums of, of kinds, uh, even for computer science or software engineering topics. And there's a lot of rents of them, they're like really opinion based. And of course, I mean, we are in a university, but also you are professionals, or so hopefully to be professionals, and uh, you want to operate evidence-based, right? So it's perfectly fine saying something, the person did something wrong, just to you know, be clear where it is and why it is. In this context of the review, that's usually sufficiently clear, I would think, right? Because it's like, you know, immediately under the comment field, under the issue and item. But I think it's never as a good way of uh, kind of thinking about it and stru structuring your thoughts when you want to give the response. I guess in this is was quite easy. It will be a bit harder in the second one, hopefully. So just maybe to beef it up a bit. Uh, but that's really part of the idea. So a bit of a, a, a um, um, kind of um, encouragement, suggestion to just, you know, check if your reviews, if you're okay with them in principle. If not, uh, mark, uh, you know, indicate this to us. And we uh, look at it from the opposite side. We do meta review, what's called. So basically look at the reviews and specifically uh, look at the code as well and see the deltas in the reviews because they're sometimes uh, uh, most indicative for issues in the code is a very different assessment. If one is very happy with the submission, the other one is very unhappy, even though they use the same schedule, then there's probably something wrong. Either there's some weird behavior of your instance or somebody got it wrong, we don't know. Something we, that's our problem, we need to figure that out, right? So we have this high level perspective that we need to employ. I'm coming back to you guys on that. Um, so, but that, that's, the, that's the other side of the medal. And then what uh, we will do, we aggregate the overall uh, observations that we make so we're not picking out individuals or individual submissions saying, hey, this is a nightmare there. In fact, if we have a, a really good one, a good example, stereotypical, I may ask the corresponding uh, a submitter if that's okay to just, I don't know, anonymously draw it out and show it. But, but uh, if not, then we'll just highlight the general channels that we still see. And you know, where channel, channels are general, then usually I want to address them again, because it means that I haven't done a good job conveying information, right? Uh, if there's only here and there some spotty you know, use of uh, uh, whatever, wrong error codes, you name it, of course, then uh, that is probably not a 
systemic uh, kind of problem. So just to give you a bit of transparency of how we use this uh, market. So it's not just we want you to, to guys to do work in addition to you doing your own work, so you're creating your own work, but actually to see how it actually fits in with the bigger picture uh, of uh, how we align and adjust um, our, our teaching. So please feel free to ping us. I mean, uh, yeah, Discord, whatever else. And, uh, you know, um, also, also those guys possibly, and they can just ping me in worst case, or we'll figure it out. But we had some some requests of people that had some issues with the assignments or reviews, and we can adjust that as well. So we have that uh, opportunity as well. You will not get penalized if you did something wrong in the review. The point is, you're not you're great for doing the review, uh, but at this instance, it's really about doing the review in the first place. Um, okay. So second one is um, ah yes, there's a two there. Assignment two. Um, did anyone start already? Is anyone finished already? Not? I was sending, I'm planning to hand out an assignment three today. Okay, oh, good. Oh, no, no, just joking. Um, no, I think planning wise, we're now on the 15th of March. Submission was? Uh, 28th. Oh, 29th? Oh, 28th? Okay, sure. I, I think I put 29th there, right? But the point is actually Monday, it's a holiday. So I'm technically not allowed, I think, <laughs> to put submissions on a Monday. But if anyone wants to push an overnighter on the 28th, series, I can't just make it every 29th. Point is that's Easter holiday anyway, right? So you guys will not have any uh, uh, obligations. So 28th, sure, um, whatever works. So that's would be the deadline. So we have how many weeks left? <sighs> Two, there you go. Thanks for doing the maths for me. Um, they definitely wouldn't have let me into the bachelor here. So, um, so two weeks left. I think if anyone has not remotely started, they are remotely should get started in any case, right? So it's time to get started. The the the, the exercise is not terribly well. What's the experience of the one that have actually started? What's your experience if you want to share either via chat or otherwise? Someone you said, yeah, please. Um, I mean, yes, you're right. It's like the last one, but uh, I think there are still can be tricky for many, especially if you pick up if you're authenticating at the uh, location and all that. So it's, I feel like the web would be like part of the. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So carefully, yeah. I heard authentication. And I nearly fell backwards because please, there's no authentication on the web hook, right? There's no username and password, just the signature thing, if you wanted to. Or what do you mean with the registration, basically? When, when I think about authentication, I think about handing usernames and passwords. And that's getting scary. So that's mostly about integrity checks and all that kind of stuff. So just to contextualize, the point is good. Um, that is actually the intent. <laughs> Half of the weight of the assignment should be in the latter part. So the earlier part is actually reasonably straight uh forward right and the apis yeah good comment i actually not as um developed let's say as the ones you have had previously so they are slightly more careless example of not so nice apis and probably also uh, they require you to kind of because you will not have a straightforward implementation of what you need to provide in terms of services there will be a bit of more workarounds that you need to think about there's also more freedom of doing the linkages being in APIs. In the previous example or case, I was really concerned, or one concern was really ensure that they're properly linked and work well with each other. Slightly less so here, but you have all the tools and background and resources to do that. You're also free to use third-party APIs, yet another API, if you see the need of it, in, right? So it's just a pointer in the side. But yes, they are not as straightforward, I, I uh, agree. And um, any particular observation with respect to inconsistency would be really helpful uh, because, of course, I haven't spotted all the possible issues when playing with them. Um, so, yes, so regarding the registration of the webhooks, um, it is, of course, a bit of a challenge, right? But I think the minimum requirement is that everyone implements webhooks in uh, the registration business, right? So, and then the invocation site, right? We talked about the webhooks earlier. Please say yes, yes, they did. Um, so I want everyone to implement webhooks in the widest sense, right? How far you push the integrity checks and so on, that's something I will leave to you, right? For example, the um, um, obscurity, uh, security by obscurity on the URL, I talked about this a bit. And of course, the signature um, that is um, kind of, kind of uh, passed alongside the message to ensure um, integrity, right? The code is all there, right? So it's all in the... Um, Repo. So you can, you know, if you if you kind of want to recall what we did in the last session, or you want to rewatch the video and kind of replay what I did to some extent, all the code is in the repository, right? Under webhooks team. I just want to clarify this. And the same applies to Firebase as well, if you're thinking about any of those terms, because you will need this, 
use that as well. It's going to be clear. And you're free to use that, uh, you know, as a starting point. They're oftentimes so general by intent, web hooks and fire, for example, uh, that they, of course, don't provide you with a solution, but they are provide you with a starting point for that particular feature, right? How you link it up with anything else? Okay, so that's again your problem. But at least you should be have a good uh, solid starting point. If that's not the case, or uh, if you even identify bugs in any of those uh, or issues and so on, just highlight those um, as well and then pull request or otherwise, or just put them out. So I'm happy to fix those as well. But they're meant to be somewhat teaching examples, so somewhat minimalistic, but nevertheless easily readable and over documented. So that's more commenting in there generally than uh, I would expect from you guys um, anyway. Good. Okay. So um, two comments. I got some feedback. See how Mark figured it out. Um, and that is, um, I, I was actually wrong. I made issues on my specification on parameters. In fact, it would have worked, but I just wanted to be clean. If you have coded, you know, that already the interface has developed the interface. I get to that in a second. Uh, just indicating your comments, then you'll be fine as well, because I would feel uneasy if you had invested too much time in this already. However, on the other hand, I think from a flexibility point of view, you would still be able to adjust it. And what has happened? Well, here, if you see the request um, for a country, right? So if you, for example, make a request on the Corona uh, service endpoint v1 for a country, and we take Norway, um, in the previous version, I just suggested there is an optional parameter called, uh, no, that's not optional, that's a parameter uh, that indicates the date um, range. Yeah. And what I forgot to indicate is basically the key of that parameter. So the parameter only had a value, it basically would read year only, right? So, but generally when you define parameters for, for querying, you have a key value uh, relationship, right? You say uh, scope and then the date range or whatever, and then end user equals, uh, you know, uh, Torbjörn, I don't know, whatever. So you always have an identifier associated with a particular value. I forgot that uh, throughout some of them. So in all instances, I added the scope keyword into the URIs and the specifications and the examples. I hope I did this consistently across. It affects basically, um, yeah, this API in particular here, the first one, ah, this one as well. So uh, have a look in uh, if that makes sense. If that violates or is now inconsistent with yours, please indicate it, then we can respond to this accordingly. But I think it should still be feasible to accommodate it. Uh, that's always the point. I mean, um, rereading your own spec five times is a good idea, but the point is at some stage you're so blind to it because it still works, that's the problem. Um, but it's not a proper uh, spec. It should, of course, be somewhat aligned with best principles and practices that we talked about when defining REST API. So uh, I've been explicit about it. So in case you want to find out where the changes happen, that's around this area. If you haven't started yet, it will not affect you. It's also non, it's a trivial change. It's a syntactic change, no semantic change. So. Um, okay. Questions or comments? First question, am I in the right class? No questions there, that's interesting. So in any case, I encourage you to look at the, uh, so again, your observation is spot on, of course. I mean, uh, the initial part is quite straightforward. The weight is on the webhooks bit, right? So once you get the initial bit started, then you have a very different perspective on the on the webhook side. Um, but even that, once you get the hang of it, you should be quite quick implementing it. Again, draw on the demo that um, is provided to you. You can also take code from there, no harm. But don't take code from each other. But you can plagiarize me, but not others. But generally, you want to indicate where you took it from anyway. Even if you have Stack Overflow and you take something from somewhere, uh, I generally indicate it unless it's like super trivial or something. Ah, that's how I did, and you retype it, or, which is essentially the same, right? That's not a big deal. But especially if it's code that's a bit more involved and doesn't read like something you probably would write, for two reasons. Number one, because you probably wouldn't be writing code this way, for good and bad. It may just be bad code, but it works. And the other thing that you don't quite understand what it does, which is also not a good idea generally. However, uh, I'm unfortunately not able to supervise you at all times and watch your monitors, even though I should probably. But the point is, if, if you take bad code, just just oh, no, go to understand, then that is you know possibly happening. But it would be good enough to indicate, hey, I took this actually from there, right? Even though it's not desirable. Important thing, if you read Stack Overflow in particular to uh, solve problems, and everyone will, and including me, very much so, quite often, in fact, it's important to understand what's happening there, not just uh, use Control-C, Control-V, even though that's uh, 
very desirable uh, and very attractive for me. So very important. So and learn how to reference because that will be important for your bachelor as well. Who call? Um, all right. So much about that. Now some other topic. Uh, so if there are no questions, you can raise them. Or if there are questions, in fact, you can still raise them um, later as well. So now looking at the assignment, um, or you know, starting off from the assignment, if you like. Uh, one of the questions that I gave you along the way, like two weeks ago now, I believe, was um, um, to find out the missing bits that we still need to finish the assignment. What aspects are we still missing? We incrementally worked towards them. There's still something missing. Please. Um, uh, I would maybe suggest a, uh, a deeper uh, look into goal routines and how you can uh, work with them. Yeah, um, just one comment. I was talking to Marsh about this, uh, specific that issue, and he suggested he had a lecture on this some time ago, and it should be linked in our thing. I can stick this out again, but I'll have a look again if that's uh, how that is. But Go routines would definitely, it's relevant here, yeah, it's no questions, you're right, uh, because co that's concurrency handling in Go. Uh, but uh, I'll see in how far either back reference to those ones or uh, indeed focus on this one. Um, but I actually was slightly looking to something uh, 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 else, um, but I'll take this in, um, related to the assignment. What are we still missing? There's still some bits misses you don't know about and how to do it and how to solve them. Please. Yeah. Wait, should be replied, right? I didn't say that. How mean is that? What did I say, actually? There you go. Amnesia sets in. Deployment, where is it? Deployment will be deployed on an IAS solution, right? So there we are, IAS. So the idea is you, you of course, are very aware how to possibly, if you had to, deploy it, right? So guess what? You would use Heroku again, and then everyone would be happy, hopefully. Um, but the idea is, of course, in the, in the, to kind of have a bit of progression on that basis as well. In that form. So that's the bit they're still missing IAS uh, and haven't really talked about it um, um, to date. So uh, today I want to kind of shift to that perspective. So to date we have largely course looked at programming first, right, getting Golan somewhat handy. Uh, Marish provided the baseline um, uh, introduction to that in particular. Then we look more Golan in the context of web services, more generally, specifically REST web services. Then deployment using Heroku as one of the key themes. And then we incrementally build up more bits and pieces from left and right, right? So look at different API solutions, like Gra uh, GraphQL, for example, but also different um, services that we can link, such as Firebase for persistence. But still, we are deploying on Heroku or something, right? Which was a platform as a service uh, system. So now we're kind of incrementally moving uh, towards the, 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 a different perspective where we really want to manage and deploy more comprehensively. So IIS solutions are part of the next exercise. Here's the thing. I promise you, even though it's now interviews reasonably late, I mean, two, two weeks to, to the deadline and so on, uh, that's certainly not too late, no worries, because the deployment will not be the biggest of your concerns. I mean, that's just a different system you deploy on, to be honest. But you learn something along the way, and we'll pick up on this and stretch this further. This will also be important when we talk about, we haven't yet, but we do that. Wow, it will be the holiday nearly, right? I should write the NTNU rector to abolish an Easter holiday. I think that's a waste of your time. You should actually spend it in a classroom. Um, but uh, that's probably not going to happen this semester. So watch out for the future. Um, uh, because we need to talk about the projects, meaning your third you know, assignment that you probably need to do, because we don't have much time left after that. Um, so that's something we talk about as well. But uh, the key thing there is that um, you will, of course, need to deploy it on in a more advanced form using containers and so on. But for this instance, we'll simply not have the time and opportunity to do that. Okay, infrastructure, the service. So we are finally there, uh, halfway through the course, admittedly somewhat late, I guess. So infrastructure, the service, what was that again? Please, anyone, including chat? They have an eye on chat, I'm sure. Uh, please. Uh, I think it's like, we have computer. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so it was a response basically um, that the computer and yet you kind of doing all the configuration in a way, right? The key difference is there. Where's the where's the computer? That computer that you're referencing? Uh, no, I mean it's, it's 
a server, right? But it's like in the cloud. And yeah. Like so it's kind of a remote managed yeah. server service that you're saying, right? Okay. So is that all? So it's one computer in the cloud or somewhere. So how is that different web hosting? I mean, you know, I'm mean, sure you could, a few years back, you could, or can still do it anyway, but uh, rent a host, um, uh, a root server effectively, or some sort of, uh, sorry, a hosted server basically, and then you have remote connection. That's the machine that's in someone's data center. But is that the same as what we think about IIS? Yeah, so it's one form, please, sorry, please. Yeah, yeah, I think it were. No, I mean, it kind of feels like it's being in like scale differently. Ah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, you get you onto it. Yeah. So what's different? It's not the same. Oh, uh, is it? It can look like the same, but it's kind of not. So that's something to do with uh, like deployment and like uh, uptime. So um, there is a comment that is uh, possible a question rather, but it's the, related to deployment and uptime. Uh, implicitly, yes, clearly, yeah. But what's the, the the technical foundation is a bit different. That's the main point, right? I mean, what was the, the key three features that we talked about in the context of IIS systems that are somewhat managed? Beautiful exam question. Guaranteed. Oh, yeah, security is well. You know, kind of not. We get back to the security bit. Is a is a, is a it's an important one. Well, um, I guess the way um, the, the what's the what are the foundational aspects of a computer that you know we need to have to build them from operating systems? What or for from a cloud computer? What are the foundational services you need to have in order to have a computer in the first place? Yeah, that's do I onto it? Yeah, do you ask them whether it's an operation system level? My immediate response is no, lower than that. Okay, networking. Yep, cool. Number one, number two. Yeah, exactly. CPU and storage, right? Thank you. Someone saved me here. That's how you get away without doing the slides and realizing you forgot what you want to say, but then you get saved. No, jokes aside. So it's three elements in, in IS systems that are kind of, you know, uh, represented in whatever form. In fact, in ideal, in virtualized form, right? Being networking, computing, and some sort of storage, right? So uh, and that's precisely the level we're moving now down to. I showed you this figure here previously. I just want to iterate over this again. So uh, different forms of services and how they kind of are as a service forms and how they kind of uh, trade off their uh, entail. So every time we're thinking about a um, service that we provide, a computer or whatever else, I mean, exactly the example you mentioned before, we think about this in terms of a level or, or a stack of different functionality, right? That's provided, right? And everyone, is remotely reminded of the, you know, for example, TCP model that is not quite a line of course, but it kind of has a similar feature set uh, on the computational side, the node side. And fundamentally, the idea is that we have storage facilities, we have processing and networking facilities making up the baseline computer, right? So the basis on which an operating system can run. So operating system, next one. And then basically the operating system, of course, we can deploy services and services can be composed to applications. Maybe web front end or whatever not, or maybe simply REST web services. They would fall in this category. Uh, there are operating system services such as a DNS server. Or something. So, and uh, the the variability. So the, this composition doesn't change per se. We always need all those, right? So in order to have a you know fully functioning uh, um, um, cloud computer in a wider sense, if you like, but even physical well cloud computer because it's network connected. A physical computer could also be not connected, even though that sounds increasingly unrealistic in the modern setting. But the idea is basically who manages what, and that's the main difference across the different as a service model, right? So what is managed by you, what is managed by others? I want you guys to kind of reflect on this uh, uh, more explicitly, because those are the essential points effectively, where in the software as a service world, you basically just uh, buy the entry to Office 365 or whatever you want to do and do everything in there, but you don't need to do anything beyond mere configuration perhaps. 
um, the, in, the, in, the, in the past world, you have slightly more control, right? You can deploy your own code. It's no longer uh, that you assume you can only use that particular application on Heroku. No, bad luck. You actually need to write the application. Otherwise, Heroku is of no value to you, right? So you need to write uh, uh, the application. But nevertheless, it needs to be able to interact with the um, 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 you know, uh, platform, yeah, that's right. The platform, platform is a service that's uh, provided by them, right? So you are committed to the Go versions they support. You're, need, you're constrained also to the different programming languages provided. Uh, deployment methods, uh, how to do logging, um, how to do monitoring in the first place. So a lot of constraints on, that are imposed upon you, the kinds of service you can do, sometimes even the kind of communication you can do if you were to use different platform providers. Heroku is admittedly, I mentioned that before, one of the permissive ones is a lot easier to use than others, uh, for example. And then for IIS infrastructure as a service, we raise the bar even, 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 even further to some extent that, you know, what is really managed by you completely, that's the stuff that's not squared out, and what's managed by you to, to kind of some extent or rather is configured by you. And that's really where IIS comes in, that you are completely responsible for, and that's what, what you, you started off with, your, um, the idea that uh, you need to manage your own computer in a way, right? So, you know, operating system, you need to install software, ensure security patched, uh, uh, deal with deployment of that server, but also things on that server, right? In Heroku, it's kind of prescribed. They can say, ah, yeah, commit to that repo, and we do it for you in a way, right? So it's the, that's the, the endpoint effectively. Here, it's on you. I mean, you can set up something that is CI integrated or you upload it via SFTP or I, I don't know. So it's really open-ended here in the setting. Operating system is also your choice. You want Windows, Linux, which version? Ubuntu LTS, please. Yeah, go for it. Uh, right, but not necessarily any. Well, I don't know. So you have the great flexibility here, including the responsibility. The thing that's, of course, what is provided in some form or another is networking, processing, and storage. You still need to configure it, but fundamentally it's provided by the um, provider. So that's the key idea. And that's the main point I want to get at when I asked about IIS. It's really about what is provided in order to construct this computer that you can host or the service that you can host. And that's essentially that these providers are only in their purest form committed to providing a virtualized form of network, virtualized form of computer power processing, and storage, of course, right? Please. And have you said that I missed it, but it is not always on the IAS alarm. Yeah. On that one. So there, there, yeah. yeah. So how can you actually like remotely connect to it? So uh, then I've missed the beginning of your question. If so there is no operating system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, of course. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. I mean, generally, you configure or you are you are suggesting the operating system when you launch such a machine, right? So you basically say, "Hey, I want this instantiated with a bare bone, I don't know, you know, Windows uh, um, 2016 server, what is it, 2019 server, or uh, Ubuntu 2020 20, uh, 2004 LTS or 20 or 16 LTS or whatever." Um, so no, yeah, you're right. There's, it's, it's somewhat automated for you, but you never less need to be aware of it and make the explicit choice, right? So here you don't have that choice, right? You get what you get. So why do people go with fast instead of like I, I guess, yeah. if like at the end I kind of understand something that you're getting an operating system and then you can change it. Unlike fast, if you just get operating system. So the question was basically, okay, why would anyone go for a pass if I have this flexibility? I'm, I'm paraphrasing you to some extent. Uh, if I have the flexibility that I get in IIS by choosing my own operating system, why would I sh should I commit to this constraint that pass imposes upon me? So anyone, that's a question I give back because I don't know the answer either. So actually, I think I know now. Oh, what's the answer? Uh, maybe you have maintained like the pass maintaining it. Yeah. So there is overhead, right? So you are suddenly having a complete responsibility. And for us, it's always easy to forget that as uh, software developers, because ah, cool, yeah, I can manage my operating system, no big deal, right? So app update, app upgrade, I do that, I script that, who cares, right? But you also just think from a user perspective that, you know, uh, uh, basically just wants to run your software, but they don't necessarily want anyone to have any sort of commitment on that level or deal with this or deal with denial of service attacks, bad luck, uh, you know, potential scalability issues or configuration of scalability managed here for you, right? So, and let alone patches on, on, on op, uh, operating systems on, right? So, I mean, if you guys have uh, followed the news, uh, IT news in the last few weeks, what was the big deal that has happened? NFTs. Sorry? Yeah. NFTs, yeah, that, that's a different uh, category. That's a total category innovation, 
we can talk about non-fungible tokens at some stage as well. That's a good point. But I want to get at something more conservative when it comes to system administration. What was the big deal there in the last uh, two or three weeks? Something you guys should be aware of those things, actually. Because, I mean, you, you will find yourself in a situation where you um, consult or inform or recommend um, activities to others. So you want to be aware of this. That's something that's kind of a homework that is part of your profession. That's right. Very good. Um, the uh, two, two mentioned it, uh, vulnerable exchange servers and etc. over vulnerability, precisely a point, right? So uh, Microsoft Exchange, everyone, yes, right? You guys know, right? You kind of forcefully use it to, to some extent, I guess, by having the NTNU email address, right? Um, and they have uh, had a significant vulnerability in the endpoint service, I think even the web uh, endpoint, if I get it correctly. So I've seen it. And But the issue is relatively straightforward. Let's actually patch out, but no one installs, or many, you know, companies don't install an exchange is just the number one in the organizational setting for email uh, and you know kind of those kind of calendar management and so on um so it's very important to keep an eye on this and actually uh, patch those a very good example of the responsibility that comes along when you actually need to manage software right had you have an SaaS software as a service kind of solution basically you buy it from microsoft on a subscription basis right pay your ten dollars per month or i don't know I have no idea what it is, but you're hypothetical and just use their service directly. Guess what? That's not part of your worries. Your worries will be, you know, uh, how to ensure that my customers know about my email addresses. That's roughly where it stops. And when it's down, whom to call and say, hey, guys, something is wrong with the system. Bring it back up or I'm not paying you. Right. So that's the that's the kind of dimension. And here is really on you. So here that is a, it's a big deal and still up to date, I think. And the patch has been out for some time, still 16,000 unpatched instances. So there you go. Not every company has simply has the either ability awareness or um, you know skill. I'm not want to push it too far, but at least the, the competence to kind of really react to such an uh, event, and that's substantive. So um, yeah, so something you want to be aware of. So the man maintenance can be important uh, and expensive, <clears throat> and depending how you are employed, you may not know also always be in the position to kind of directly intervene because you will be perhaps on the development side and not. An, so much involved in the operations, but even if not, you still want to pick up on this. Okay, so I think we covered that trade off again to some extent. It's important that you kind of realize the differences between those three categories because they come up and up again, starting in the first lecture and now again in this lecture as well. So it's never ending story. Um, this is a slide that I'd like to bring up sometimes because it's uh, quite funny that someone has ever attempted this in the first place. It's ridiculously outdated, so don't waste any time reading it. Um, but it shows that someone actually tried to, in the early days, in that was in 2009, to plot out the cloud landscape, expecting they would be able to kind of plot all different categories, subcategories, sub subcategories, subcategories. I think they did this for two more years and they have stopped this whole business because it just went out of hand, right? So the whole cloud uh, infrastructure in terms of, um, yeah, literally infrastructure, uh, software that was available to be deployed on cloud services, platform services, and also software services just exploding out. But what is interesting is that the category will still roughly hold, right? You have either infrastructure services, infrastructure is service, we talked about literally right now, the platform services, if you like, and there are still a few that are still there, for example, platform services like Google App Engine is still out there, uh, yeah, and various other ones. I mean, um, they're, they're, uh, yeah, they're, the attempt was really to kind of be really in, um, comprehensive, different databases and so on, they're also still available. And then, of course, Software service and then software that can be used across to some extent that you can employ on uh, infrastructure services that you can invoke from platform services and so on. So that was the, the rough idea. But I think this has completely gone out of hand. So, uh, uh, but what is important to you in this course is that, that you're aware of this ecosystem, right? The environment that exists. And you will be, of course, also aware that we can't cover all of this, hopefully. Um, um, and if not, then please write it in the course evaluation and I need to reconsider having a course that is more like a librarian course, like going through all the different um, instances of this. But what I want you to recognize is the big the high level categories, right? Again, there's infrastructure stuff, platform, software, and cross-cutting service provision uh, that is still out there. And um, all the features, um, however, even though that's kind of nicely laid out and uh, separated, the world has become a muddy, uh, a very muddy place in a sense that none of the service providers really is clearly sticking to one anymore, right? They all have branched out. LWS plays in all those territories nearly. Um, Google likewise as well, traditionally already. We'll get back to that in a, sec a second. But those would be the ideal forms, of course, if we had that. 
Okay, so um, just to summarize, I think we discussed this quite nicely already, is um, the trade-offs between PASS and SAS, uh, IAS, sorry, that one. Um, so PASS is really the more general uh, focus on the application services, what I'm deploying, what I'm running, right? So running. So I don't need to quick care about the underlying infrastructure, let alone virtualized hardware. Um, and um, it's generally also nicely integrated for deployment because you can't really do much on the server there and rely on their operating system. You need to rely on them providing you with the facilities to upload information as well, to deploy uh, software as well in the first place. So built-in is usually quite nice um, tool chain as well. The challenges, um, yeah, what are the challenges? Pass, just to summarize again. Past challenges, all the pains, if you like, if anyone has any, had any. Shield configuration, but what's the other pain? Well, yeah. Uh, maybe that uh, because you don't have access to the OS, you have to watch out that your application and whatever you want to run uh, works on that. Mm -hmm. So you that's can. From dependencies. Ah, yeah, that's on the chat. Cool. Yeah. So when do you're talking about monitoring, right? Um, just uh, in response to this one. So there was a there was a concern, by the way, a revision for the camera. Uh, concern is that uh, uh, how do you ensure that the stuff they actually deploy is actually running, right? So and my response to this is like uh, monitoring uh, uh, as, as a summary, and that's right. Oftentimes in those services, you're spot on. They have the facilities to do that, but that's where the additional surcharge comes into place, right? Then you basically pay then also for the monitoring of your own activity, right? So that's where it quickly comes into ticking additional boxes in your subscription and suddenly be charged for it and then it kind of works magically or not and then there was the uh, what was the comment again platform dependency. platform dependency was mentioned on the chat uh, exactly so you that's a relatively strong vendor lock in generally you're buying into the api effectively right you your tooling needs to adopt uh, like the the integration of heroku yeah if you're using git good luck that would work i mean that's pretty cool right but it could be also more painful uh, in terms of the deployment tool chain, but worse on the code um, side as well, code specific accommodations, right? In Heroku, we literally had only one accommodation we need to do, which is like luckily super generic, right? The port uh, environmental variable. Please remember that. Some do. The ones that remember that assignment one. Let's see, that's a good indication. Um, but um, so that's really few, that's very limited accommodation. So that's why I want to explicitly. Re uh, kind of recollect this because you will will likely forget it uh, otherwise because it's so minuscule. But if you do use another pass service such as Google App Engine, uh, has been around for a while by the way, um, then you really need to rewrite your code entirely for network communication in particular. So it would be completely or hardly maintainable uh, again. So the login would be so rigid that you likely wouldn't change your vendor if you have a substantive investment of um, uh, you know code in there. So okay, so that's 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 the challenge there. We've um, so it's good to remind yourself of this, right? You're buying into an ecosystem and infrastructure that is provided for you at the expense of you committing to it, right? So you become a Herokuian or Google App Engine uh, person or whatever else. So IS, again, we have this mixing of services and infrastructure, infrastructure being the basis, right? With networking, processing, storage, and the application services on top, operating system and whatever else service you want. You have like complete access to the raw, well, more or less complete access to the raw resources, can configure operating system, can delete your main hard drive, can do backup, can forget to do backup, then because with great power comes great responsibility, right? So that's the downside immediately. Uh, you need to be able um, to kind of uh, configure the system, maintaining it from the operations side, but also to uh, deal with the um, uh, you know, management of it, right? Securities, so OS updates, deployment. Um, so there's a lot of baggage that comes before you actually deploy your first piece of, piece of code. In Heroku, it was really pain-free, right? So you literally sign reasonably. Create an account, log into your account, clone, uh, add the upstream to your existing repository, and then push, push the Heroku uh, to the Heroku branch, and kind of in the ideal world, it's sorted, right? You're done. Uh -uh, not quite here, right? So the pain is quite a bit uh, more extended, something to be aware of, both in set, um, um, setup, but also in uh, complexity. So, okay, before we go on, 
I'm mean, really on time in my break. Otherwise, first of all, you fall asleep. Um, and second of all, um, I get informal sanctioning. Um, so 15 minutes break for the ones of you that still awake. The rest can just sleep through the break. It's fine. And then um, I talk a bit more about uh, motivations for IS and hopefully get to one instance of an IS system you can actually use. Uh, I'm well over time, so so for that. So sometimes interesting discussions emerge in all directions. Um, let's see whom we can still excite for and be a little more. Uh, um, all right. Nice. We have discipline again. How beautiful is that, isn't it? Let's, let's see if we can recover all this when uh, this whole craziness is over. Because now it's good, 15 people listening, but see if it still works with 70. Right? Everyone has been out for a year and doesn't know how the university looks like anymore. Anywho, okay. Um, so before the break, I was just, again, spending quite a bit of time on motivating the difference between SaaS, uh, PaaS, and IIS. Admittedly, since the break, I'm thinking about Golang now, so it's not really helpful, but um, we, we get back to it. So, and I made, mainly made the point that there's about uh, platform independence is one of the challenges, right? Or you made the point, rather, and the maintainability or obligation on the part of the, um, you know, uh, responsible, right, to, to run services and servers and so on. Painful. So, are there other reasons why you, as developers in particular, or DevOps, who knows, or data engineers, of course, um, in, in, in whatever other facility, um, should consider IAS or deal with this. Why don't you just say, who, who, I don't care about operating systems, I have one. I mean, I buy my laptop with one. Why should I bother with all this configurability? I just want to be able to install my software and better code Go, right? Because Go is the most beautiful language on the planet. So, um, so why do I need to bother? Why should you bother as a software developer with IAS? Is there something that has to do with like um, in terms of like this and uh, platforms as a, as a service? Is there something like one is better to use in deployment and another is used to better in uh, development? Interesting. Right? Because like uh, if you have a platform and a service, you don't have to necessarily worry about um, like uh, I don't know, like scaling with um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so just, I uh, just uh, uh, paraphrase you. So um, the, the the suggestion was basically, hey, uh, you know, on the trade-offs basically lying in different forms of uh, you know use case. Let's say for deployment or for running stuff or for development. If I get it about right, right. right. So, yeah. so and is that the reason why we should also need to know about IS? Because perhaps deployment is easy on pass, but actually running it becomes increasingly more easy or whatever, right? So on IS kind of systems, yeah, there's something to it. Yep. So that's that's actually again a tech technical perspective i guess let's put an economical perspective on it How, what would you look at if you were to worry about technology uh oh economics wrong one wrong class again please go to the b building right is that your response economy big nice you have less overhead with you have less overhead with infrastructure as a service interesting good question very good question. I can't answer it, but uh, it's interesting because it boils down how the past people organize themselves, right? What I agree with you is uh, most certainly you, of course, can can't tailor the deployment and the platform structure to your specific solution as much, right? If you had IS full control, you really can, you know, have a very slim operating system, only install activate the service you want, you know, find some fire uh, databases and so on. Um, that's right. That's a good point. Uh, fundamentally, you're right. But unfortunately, not quite. I want to get it. <laughs> but that's, I'm I'm leading. Yeah, uh, uh, you sorry for that. But um, but it's that's that's it's operating another point, right? It's about efficiency, as you're saying, productivity. Um, well, when well, sometimes we need to look at technology, and also you guys, when you say, you know, you'll be in five or so years, you find yourself in a situation, ask, okay, okay, I know my stuff now. I'm working, you know, in a, in, in my job is working out and so on, but. I probably should look at the new programming language to kind of brush up and keep my skills up to speed, right? So, and how do you decide which programming language to look at? And who has not considered doing that in five or six years? Yet, you should. 
So it's about keeping up to speed with uh, new technological development. But how do you decide? So much out there. That's so video on YouTube. Ah, oh, cool. That sounds easy. We'll show you basically that the cheapest feature of the program. If you say you're completely convinced I'm buying it, that's the best thing for everything. That's one approach, of course. But what other approaches could you use to kind of make an advised decision? This is now, OK, I'm bending it towards programming languages. I'm here looking at more something else. But what, what would be an indicator in programming languages you would rely on? I think you just there's not really um, just go for it. Yeah, what about GitHub? Yeah. Cool, yeah, that's one way, yeah. That's actually what people do. Um, check what's the most heavily used programming language on GitHub. What is it right now? Yeah. I was uh, having that in mind as well. My cache, I still had cached that it was JavaScript, but I may be, may be wrong. Okay. All right, so they, they annually kind of publish. You can look it up as well. I think GitHub Trends or something, and then uh, see what programming languages are more popular. So that's one way of looking at it. So community centric, right? There are other indices as well, like Tiobe Index. Anyone you hear about this thing? Should look it up. Tiobe Index, T I O B E. Anyway, I'm not doing programming languages here, so, uh, but it's good to see you know, what the adoption level is based on community. They do basically search, uh, searches across different platforms like Google and so on and kind of aggregate basically results. But Okay, so what are you looking? You effectively look at the market of programming languages, right? Because most programming languages are free, right? There's not really market value in a, in, in a monetary sense there, but the market value in terms of what's the value of your skill, you most likely, or the pay you would get for that skill on the market, right? Is it relevant, right? I mean, you could, guys could go for Fortran or Cobalt, beautiful market in the 1960s, right? But again, actually, um, because, you know, someone needs to maintain those old systems as well, right? So, uh, but again, so that's about niches, but generally we'll look at something like this. And coming back to cloud now, never let's look up Tiobe next, quite interesting what you see there. Um, you know, where the, where's the market basically? That's the question, right? So, and that's a prediction by, um, you know, some, one, one of those consulting um, uh, companies is there, um, that Sky had networks. But nevertheless, it's, it's interesting to see various of those predictions. They all kind of point to a similar direction. They're suggesting basically that the gap between different forms of services or as a service provisions is getting larger, right? Um, in the initial uh, stage, there was, um, you know, much more narrow gaps between us. So in 2017, they reported, reportedly had a uh, revenue of billion of dollars uh, for SaaS services as a dominant one of about 80 billion, right? So for 15 in comparison for a past service, platform as a service. And when we look at it, 2021 prediction, that is from, I think they're made in 2019 or 2020. So that's a prediction actually, it's nice to assess now. Uh, we have roughly a doubling there in the past world. Cool, there's more past. Yeah, I did the right choice and picked Heroku in 2017. Not sure how old they are actually. But if you look at this one here, we have a, uh, from uh, from 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 80 is not a doubling, of course, like in 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 the past case from a very low level. But you see that actually the the tra trajectory of uh, adoption of infrastructure as a service is increasingly higher. I mean, you get increasingly more popular, yeah, thereby implicitly relevant on the dog market, right? So the argument here is not so much uh, you know that you guys should look at the exact numbers, but you want to see the trends in there, right? And what we're seeing here is clearly that. Um, um, so by the way, this is SaaS. Uh, sorry, I should have looked this one. Um, there's actually a trend doubling here. Sorry, we have 30 uh, billion roughly in 2017. We have 76 now. That's two and a half times. Um, so uh, you see that the trajectory for IS is simply higher as for pass. So the, 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 the conclusion you can draw from there is that in the long run, IS will simply be more uh, relevant in the field, right? So pass is often taught more for small scale deployments, for prototyping, incremental development. You saw how lean and smooth this is for just trying out stuff. But when things become serious, complexity rises, you either end up paying for a lot of for additional services that they provide, monitoring, uh, uh, you know, additional threads, runners, clocks, and all those timers and all those features that you get there. Or eventually you say, you, 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 uh, and then, but also you're increasingly invest in this ecosystem, or you say, yeah, screw it, I'm not happy, it's not happening with me. I'm switching to infrastructure as a service. I host my own ecosystem, basically. So at least I have some flexibility of moving, controlling, and whatever else it, right? So, uh, and it may actually be um, cheaper to some extent because there's a, quite a quite a there's a bit more competition implicitly 
here um, on two fronts. Um, and this is mostly because of the level of, of, of use, uh, but also the greater flexibility. So if you think about that, you have a um, pass uh, deployment that is right sized and kind of accommodates the structure of Heroku, it's very hard to move this one, right? Your competitor would need to provide compatibility layers or something like this to make it easy and smooth if you had big investments. That's less a concern here, right? Yes, sure, the tooling changes a bit, right? Their APIs change a bit, but fundamentally what you deploy should much be compatible. If you use Docker, bad luck using Docker on the other one as well, right? So that's the kind of angle uh, presumed here. So it's a point about scalability that's to be made. So you as developers want to see what should I invest my time in? Should I learn more about past platforms or should I probably also look at IIS platforms? Because when the next job ad comes around, chances are that is in there in some way or another, right? So and that's the kind of uh, uh, angle here. So so much about economics. I don't want to push this too far, but I just want to uh, shift, show the other side of the coin that we often see things very much from a technology perspective. You know, this is more efficient. This is better. You know, you have more fine fine tuned uh, characteristics. You can optimize. You can right size. Yeah, there's more maintainability. Those are kind of micro level problems, but they're important. But when it comes about strategic decision making, then suddenly those things become more relevant because they tell you something how the market will look like in 10 years, right? And as a company, you're not planning for the short haul, you're planning for the long haul, right? You want to be and stay in the market, right size, upsize, downsize, but potentially not shift the vendor because that's just sunk cost, that's just lost money that you realize at that stage. Because if you need to shift from Heroku to Google App Engine because Google Heroku closes down, please don't close down, um, then it, it becomes really expensive right rewriting your code whereas uh, being in a platform that is likely not going down uh what about aws i don't know um then you know chances that you have done a sensible investment may be higher but we talk about this as well a bit more okay infrastructure and service so we talk very high level we talk about storage processing and this uh, networking business all the time but we need to break it down to services because that's usually how it's represented in those uh, uh ecosystems anyway so Chances are you will not find a nice configuration box for processing, networking, and storage, but it translates into some process, uh, sorry, product names or something like some sketchy uh, or uh, catchy keywords. But worse, it's usually subdivided in different forms as well that are provided, right? So, um, and what you generally see in those infrastructure as a service uh, areas, so today is really about looking at some those things from a high level, and next session we dig a bit deeper, hopefully, is that. Um, you know, there are certain services related to computing, storage, and networking. Computing typically being instances, as they call them. When they say that, they mean VMs, right? So basically, virtual machines, something you, uh, hang on, may have run on your machine right now with VirtualBox, right? But of course, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a different form of virtualization on the server side and so on. Then the second one is container services. We haven't talked about this much, uh, but it's basically, uh, you know, containing the application only and not uh, the burden of the entire operating system that usually comes with VM images. So kind of right-sizing it. We talk about this more in the context when we talk about Docker. Um, then the other dimension is, of course, storage. And storage is also not uniform. We always think, ah, cool, give me a hard drive, put stuff on there, and we're all happy. Bad luck. Um, different purposes, different storage, right? What do you need? Long-term storage, short-term, large files, small files. What is your distribution of write and read access? Do you care about fast write? Probably you only care about fast read. This is also a decision when you think about Firebase, right? So you want to use something that's fast read, but possibly not the fastest in writing. You may be better off actually sticking to uh, structured databases. And of course, what's the nature of your, your data? Is it structured, unstructured? Database versus file system, right? That kind of call. Um, and also security. So how do you want potentially offline storage so that you actually have a large boot of time that could be shut down possibly your, uh, and, and store your information? Um, uh, possibly offline and redundantly anyway. Um, and the other uh, aspect is, of course, um, the willingness you want to pay for um, uh, um, safety in the sense that you, uh, the data can be recovered in the first place. So those are generally all features that are associated with different forms of storage, but also additional features you're kind of buying. So you want to be aware of this. It's not just you're buying something and then you're done. So uh, we'll hopefully look into some of those. Networking, nightmare. So when you think about networking, who thinks that's a network cable? 
Good, you're wrong. Uh, you're right. It's not. So it's actually my cable. But um, nevertheless, so um, generally the traditional view is you have a machine, you put a network cable in there, and we all sort it, right? So that would be the network intuition that people may often have when they think about managing servers. So what networking? Don't, don't, don't bug me with this stuff. Well, here we talk about data center networking, right? So it's really about managing uh, uh, virtual networks or subdivision of potential uh, of machines and instances. Um, the management of firewalls, DNS services, so name resolution. Everyone knows what DNS is, please, right? From somewhere? Yeah, you, you guys, you or anyway. Good. That's important, right? So, um, but you may actually manage this for your own domain, right? You have the domain, you can subdomain, for example, NTNU, and then there's different, uh, let's say, departments, right? NTNU, and NTNU can manage its own domains there, uh, or domain naming, uh, for example, there. And you can not only manage like, this one computer, as we started our discussion, that you actually host something on, but your data center as well. You can basically host the data center inside a data center with all the complexity that comes along with this, right? Complex networking structures and so on. So when we think about networking, all those activities actually scale up because they're no longer meant to model one machine. They're meant to model your entire enterprise effectively in principle, yeah? So that's one of the, uh, the key principles. So those are the three main categories that fall under infrastructure. Generally, again, there's way more services that provide that kind of more fall on the platform as a service, or if not software as a service, like, you know, business intelligence suites and all that kind of stuff. That's really a platform kind of thing, because you don't install and manage that, you just use that. And then um, in um, some, some other aspect that's very important from an operations perspective, um, and uh, perhaps not as pronounced in, in uh, well, no, 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 it's very important from, a, from an administration perspective, of course, but uh, often overseen is, of course, the monitoring bit, right? First of all, how do you do deployments, right? So how do you effectively deploy your 600 machines uh, if, you have, if you want to do so? And how do you monitor their uptime effectively that they're available as well, right? So we, that doesn't necessarily come for free. In fact, in many instances, you pay for those services on top of it. But of course, do it yourself. Assuming that your machines are publicly exposed, you could monitor from outside. Uh, but it's, of course, very convenient to have it all managed in one um, system and setting. So that's the idea. Um, comments, questions? I think that's roughly what I want to mention about this. So bring it down to some um, product names, and we'll revisit some of those as well. Super briefly, I just want to motivate this a bit to, to, to see how messy it looks like in real life. Um, you know, we have different databases for this. AWS stands for Amazon Web Service. Of course, uh, you guys knew that, but uh, that they offer different databases for different purposes that are, you know, can be um, relational in structure. They can be completely unstructured in nature. They can be in-memory databases very fast, or they can be, uh, you know, um, stored databases or have a built-in um, scalability uh, features or can be graph databases and so on. So quite a bit of uh, different um, services on this level then we have function level computing i briefly alluded to this a few sessions ago function level computing what's that or function level virtualization is often that sometimes they call it serverless computing you name it what was that about mm -hmm. yeah so um the response was calling function from outside service that's fundamentally what it is. Instead of exposing an entire program or an entire REST API with all its beauty and agony, uh, what you're offering is merely one function with an endpoint. Call this thing, get something back, right? Black box, in a way. Um, can be interesting, for example, you think about uh, uh, you know, uh, calculating premium for insurance companies. So you don't necessarily provide the entire server with all the bits and bobs and reporting and all that. Just, you just want to know if I have that amount of income and that credit history, you know, what kind of premium should I give that customer? If you are, you know, uh, have done, you know, if your business model centers around collecting this information and providing this, uh, you know, boiling down to one index, which you usually won't be transparent about, that's your way to do it. You just expose that service and charge people for using this, and then they can use it in their, you know, proprietary APIs, like, you know, in, in if uh, they're in bear or whatever kind of insurance you can think about, right? So you could always outsource this particular calculation ability. Um, um, as well. Um, function level computing. AWS Lambda is the keyword here in the AWS side. Um, then there's various um, CI um, aspects, right? Continuous integration pro uh, systems that they usually support. 
uh, analytics, IoT, and so on. Those are kind of all those different uh, software services that you can build on and use in addition. There's the same on the Google side. I haven't elaborated on this, but you know, Google Compute Engine, uh, or App Engine, sorry, App Engine actually called, and Firebase, we talked a bit about this, right? So it's a motivation for one of those services that kind of don't really are, are not falling in the inter infrastructure category, but are kind of lumped together in the Google Cloud Computing world. Okay, which are the three big players? that we need to know about, learn about, in the cloud computing world. Yeah, AWS was mentioned to us. Yeah, what else? Can I back to that? Yeah, what was this? There was a noise. I heard something. Who said it? Do with Azure? Yeah, who, 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 which club offers this one? Microsoft, right? Microsoft Azure. Uh, AWS, Microsoft Azure, and you mentioned uh, digital digital ocean. digital ocean, yeah. So it's also uh, quite 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 reasonably prominent, yeah. They are a smaller player, a significantly smaller player, but they are there, yeah. Like you know, like us, rec space and so on. Yep. Um, what else? Did ever, did everyone come across digital ocean, or is that the first time you hear this? Uh, you would expect this. I mean, highly recommend you look at it, and not so much for the services they provide, but for the tutorials. They're really top notch. I mean, when they provide tutorials on new tech, how to deploy stuff, and so on, and chances are, I don't know, at least nine times out of ten, they're really spot on. For uh, you know, of course, they need to be timely. If you look at old tech, guess what? The tutorial is old. But if you want to, you know, see how you set something up or do a basic operations, learn about it. DigitalOcean has beautiful tutorials. And they're actually a very nice service, uh, I must admit, even if you use them, but they're not one of the bigger ones, uh, admittedly. But if you want to have a reasonably cheap solution and kind of want entry level uh, cloud hosting, uh, DigitalOcean is an interesting one to look at. I'm not making advertising, I'm just saying uh, by sharing my experience. Um, okay, so we have now AWS, we have Microsoft Azure. Who else? Who else is on the market? Who's one of the big three players, please? Else there would be big two players, right? So it's actually quite good that you haven't figured it out yet, because otherwise I would be blaming for having a very biased course here. Please. Like Amazon, Amazon? Yeah, so Amazon is something we have. So AWS was mentioned. Uh, I think Jason mentioned. I don't know. Anyway, so you know, so we, AWS, Amazon Web Services, and you mentioned Microsoft Azure. So those are two big ones. Um, that's one more, please. Oh, that took a while. Okay. You know, a painful process here, isn't it? Uh, yes, Google, exactly. So that's why I was surprised, actually, because usually you say, hey, you only do Google services here right now. Firebase, Golang, you know. So, um, yeah, Google, of course. Yeah. Google is the other one. Google Cloud Computing, right? Those are the cloud platform, rather. Those are the big three ones uh, that you want to be um, aware of. So, who was the first in the game? Sounds good. How did they start, actually? Does anyone know or why and how they just started? Well, is it? I uh, I think it's early too. Uh, but anyway, um, I don't want to. Uh, the, the Amazon itself is a company. I, I don't know actually when they start started, but their business model was something different, right? So it's still something different. What is Amazon actually doing? Please. Please, you know, or sorry. In general, or for AWS? in general, in general, what was the original business model? Marketplace. Yes, exactly, right. So they're actually a bookstore, right? So they sell books primarily, right? So then they opened up and said, "Hang on, we can open up that very infrastructure to outside sellers. We don't need to be the only ones having the big warehouses, which they do have, with all the books that they send out cheaply and all that stuff, quite timely, a different service, blah blah blah." Hey, but what about you know you? You want to open another bookstore? Want to sell uh, cars or? uh use toothbrushes i don't know collectibles right you can make up your own store but you need an infrastructure or platform where which you can sell right finn could be kind of a you know kind of obvious one but finn has a bit of this uh, use smell right yeah, that you actually sell uh, you know amongst peers but uh, amazon has this, this this kind of proper vendor perspective kind of uh, attached to it right so the idea is basically what they said is well you know we're no longer a bookstore we're actually an infrastructure provider we're providing you with the infrastructure, book 
search recommendation systems, billing systems, right? Uh, possibly even delivery support and all that kind of stuff that you can use in your kind of company, uh, you know, to make your own marketplace. Perfect, right? And then they push it one stretch further. Hang on. We could use our infrastructure not only for web shops and e-commerce. What about we offer our entire infrastructure for rent? So even if you're running a, I don't know, an enterprise resource planning system, HR system, you need to run your groupware solution. You need to want to run your exchange uh, um, for Microsoft or whatever else, or just host the service. Why don't you just do it? Our infrastructure is so big, we have to spare resource anyway, right? Because Amazon is huge already at that time. It took them ages to be profitable, but once they were there, they were just overwhelmingly huge. So they were quite clever. So they incrementally stepped back from their core business or added to their core business by saying, yeah, I don't, we don't have a monopoly on the selling anymore. We just provide the platform. And then we don't even have monopoly on e-commerce e anymore. We just provide the general infrastructure more or less of any computing that we do on the internet. That was kind of the vision, right? So very clever business model, extremely clever, right? Why, why would you go as far as to say we're allowing competition onto our platform? And that's literally what they do, right? So you can act in competition to them, please. They say we're allowing competition, but that's so they don't look like that's right. But the, the question is there, what are their monopoly of? Not necessarily as a bookstore anymore, but as an infrastructure provider, right? Their, their focus has shifted. And you're right, they are de facto monopoly on the, oh yeah, you shouldn't say that. I think I get sued if I make that claim here. So, uh, uh, I mean, they're not the only player, but they're a really strong and dominant player. So but in many instances, people reference them as um, having that uh, uniform position in, in, in the particular market of concern. But anyway, uh, I'll get back to this uh, because they were kind of coming the first, were the first coming out with this on a large scale. They literally say, we have unlimited computing power, we don't always use it, let's just make it publicly available, right? So to some extent. So interesting business model where they're coming from. They're not the classical tech company as you would think about it. Sure, they are a tech company, but they actually have a very specific domain they were interested in, right? Whereas the two other companies are a bit different. So Microsoft, how did they? Oh, you know Microsoft, right? So they basically did a more or less of, I don't know, they realized that they were actually the losing to some extent control of the ecosystem because uh, Microsoft was very used of being the only player on the market, having, you know, this, this um, um, generally kind of a monopoly on, on uh, computing, desktop computing, but also server-side computing in the enterprise setting. And they're basically, you know, you're buying subscriptions and run your own hardware locally, right? And they realized, okay, hang on, we also need to, you know, go get into this cloud business for two reasons. Number one, it's really hard to manage licenses when you sold them, because you don't know if people actually commit to it, you need to do controlling. What if people only want the license for a few months, not for a lifetime and so on. So they re realized that there was this demand for a bit more de demand size or demand dependent scaling, right, of services. You don't, you know, you're renting a machine for amount of time, not for eternity. So they actually got in the business and started hosting most of their own services in their own infrastructure. Um, and uh, then even went as far as to say, okay, not only do we allow the running of our, um, uh, your organizational services, our infrastructure, Active Directory is one of the key directory systems that has basically paved a large part of the success Microsoft has in the um, enterprise um, scape. Um, but also allow you to deploy your own stuff there. Same kind of model, but they come from a tech perspective, very, very much from a tech perspective only, right? Classical Microsoft Windows kind of perspective. You guys grew up with this. You have never seen something else. So it's kind of surrounding you for your life. And that, those guys basically just said, okay, we also need to move to a more uh, dynamic model. And then there was, um, okay, Google Cloud Platform. Uh, they came out slightly late. So this is really how it looks like. Those are the big three. We have Amazon Web Services, um, the Azure basically launching in 2010 officially, um, and then the Google Cloud Platform in 2011. So they're a bit of a late comer here, if you like, um, in, in, in the game to some extent. And uh, what they generally do when they advertise <coughs> is that they uh, advertise in terms of regions and zones. So just to contextualize this a bit, let me just bring this up a bit, because um, if you read this, you want to know what it roughly means. Let's see if I can bring up. Um, uh, 
those things. Uh, they basically say, okay, hey, um, worldwide we have those zones where we primarily host. That's the kind of map thing. You guys know that, right? And for once, it's not Mars; it's actually our planet. And uh, given the late news, so and basically in those uh, zones, they have interconnected data centers that they then call. Um, sorry, in those regions, they have then different zones that they have interlinked uh, with different features to, to some extent. I'm not sure if I can model in, but here, for example, uh, here's Frankfurt. Let's go with uh, Stockholm, for example, Sweden, uh, which is launched in 2018. It's one of the regions, as they call, and they have three availability zones in there. Uh, what does it effectively mean? It allows, effectively, it's very easy to shift data within that particular region between the data centers, less so across the different zones. Um, so that's the kind of stratification. This is how the, the Amazon world looks like. So we can see they're actually represented nearly everywhere um, and, and actively develop them. Ah, Jakarta is coming soon. Singapore 2010, very old one. That's, that would have been the one you would have linked to. I was, uh, when was in, in New Zealand in particular, it was always uh, Singapore as an instance that was relevant um, that you would uh, link to. Now I'm showing you perhaps the Google one here as well but the idea is fundamentally to see um, incre incrementally seek um, presence let's see look at those guys this is google which guys should be responsive there you go do we see something meet our network so it looks kind of comparable but a bit different here and there right <clears throat> Blue fun. The filter ones are current zones. The, um, the um, hollow ones are basically future regions or zones, what you basically have there. And you see they're somewhat clustered around the need, right? There's Singapore, yeah, it's not interactive, unfortunately. There's uh, Netherlands, apparently, Frankfurt as well, Warsaw is doing uh, established, Finland, and so on. So a bit of clustering around this plan. Africa doesn't seem to be properly represented. There's some uh, in, in the um, Arabian Peninsula. See, uh, Jakarta is running already. Okay, so they have all those little, you know, all those. Um, they also tell you what's available where. So it's interesting that really not all regions necessarily have all the functionality and services. So you see, for example, storage and databases. You see the Google equivalent to what I mentioned before, file store. That's the one we talked about. For example, machine learning and so. So not all the services are available everywhere, right? So it's often incrementally deployed in different regions as well. So question to you, why do we need this business of regions? I mean, come on, it's a cloud. Why would we bother? Why don't we just have one gigantic data center that solves all the problems? Why do we have this network of different sites? I mean, you know. That's right, there's one response here. Basically, uh, you mentioned speeds, OK? More specifically, what was here? What was that, that's right, right? So it's really the latency concern that is that is here primarily voiced. Uh, exactly. So the idea is still, even though we are in a globalized setting and we think that we have everything under control and are completely independent of our geographical infrastructure, I'm not sure, sometimes I get the perception, particularly in the pandemic, it's still relevant from a, a performance point of view. Just want to exemplify this briefly. Here's uh, Google setting, Google Cloud Compute Platform. Just want to show uh, two instances. We'll talk about this a bit more. In fact, you will have a chance to play with it yourself eventually. I'm not confident enough in the system that it's, we could possibly use it even for the assignment too, but we'll say, I first want to show you another deployment here, just to be safe that it actually works. But what I want to motivate briefly is uh, that it makes a difference, right? So I have deployed here two instances. They are identical with respect to infrastructure. They're both running Ubuntu 2020. Let's see if I... Uh, if I can bring up one instance just to show uh, you. Oh, that is fun. All right. Um, so they are proper, and now it's remotely logging in and just uh, showing you the instance. <clears throat> Takes a while. Um, and uh, it's, it's linking via SSH keys that needs to be set up, of course, as well. But those instances are then provided and they have a public IP. They have a private anti IP with an internal IP that they're using within, you know, some um, internal network structure. Again, we talk about this as well in context of even NTNU. But then have an external IP, right, that we connect, can connect to, right, those two ones here. Um, let's see if, if the, yeah, there you go. So it's complete proper 
instance, you can run uh, beautiful things like htop and see what's actually happening there. How much RAM we have, it's 3.6 gigabyte. There's next to no load on them. Good, hasn't been taken over yet. That's quite handy. And you are responsible for everything. You see that 18 security updates need to be done possibly, haven't done it yet. I'm to blame, right? IAS principles. So let's look at this. Um, uh, and just to um, motivate this, this, this point just made, let's see. Let's just ping them just to see what kind of differences we're dealing with. Um, so, so we did it 34, 107, 8, 2, 4, 7. So I'm pinging the first instance, which is in Europe West. Uh, I'm entirely sure where it is, but similar close. So we have a latency of uh, 50, 60, 50, I think around 50 milliseconds, right? Let's go with that. Should be fine for our purpose. So it's about good. So let's try the other one. much coding not print thing so that's the northern american one somewhere in the us so what's the latency here 150 right triple the latency right so it makes a difference and that's uh, quite remarkable because your customer will eventually tell you hey your system is like super slow and you're saying, yeah, you know, just pick the cheaper data center because problem is what determines prices in data centers? Or are they the same speed? Yeah, what, how speed, what kind of speed? So, uh, so in one of your point of connectivity, right? How well established and developed a uh, network infrastructure is in order to have fast connectivity. This is part of the reasons, by the way, why so well the choice of countries that actually serve is very strategic because they're usually very, very close to central internet hubs, effectively. So I have fastest possible connectivity. So that defines the popularity and thereby price. What's the other important factor that defines price? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, it's price you pay per instance, right? So I pay money for running those things in principle, right? So, uh, but you know, you could say, hey, I'm hosting US because it's cheaper, because the prices vary. But why could prices possibly vary? Shouldn't they all be the same? I don't care. It's one data center here, one here. Closer to me should probably be faster and cheaper. So, yeah, you're onto it. What? Priority? What, what do you mean, priority? Ah, Im implicitly you're right. Uh, generally within data centers, it's like uh, that you can get, first of all, cheaper instances, uh, instances on slower hardware, like literally because eventually they're boiled boil down to being run on hardware, of course. And you could have the previous generation CPUs because they still want to use them to some extent. What do they do? They price them down. So if you run an instance like that, you probably get uh, a lower, lower preference. Um, of course, in processing, though, that's one aspect as well. There's also um, spot instances where you can bid on cheap pricing and that when the margins hit a certain price level, only then you spin up additional instances so you can operate against the market. But let's see what the chat says. Capacity, GDPR, that is the, yes, that's right. There's, there's, an, there's an indirect component there, GDPR again, like data privacy, right? So certain requirements to host in regions that are- electricity cost for Voila, that's it. Electricity, power. Right? Data centers are really expensive to run. You do cool stuff. You need to run stuff and cool stuff, right? And they're huge. So their power bill is their number one, basically, uh, well, apart from their you know, machine hardware they're buying eventually in, in batches over years, and constantly exchange effectively. But power is the key thing, right? Power prices, right? They will determine that they sit in different countries. Connectivity and power prices. Those are the two points. Um, personnel is secondary because personnel can sit anywhere else, more or less. And uh, you don't need that many people in the end anyway for such a data center, right? Because it's merely telling you, okay, hard drive here is broken, exchange that thing, data is automatically recovered and all that kind of stuff. But it's not like everyone, you know, is waiting to kind of serve a machine in particular there. So it can be highly automated, the hardware side of things, but it's power and connectivity. So exactly. And that's why it's sometimes very expensive in different countries, it's sometimes very cheap. So you need to make the call, do I take, what do I go for, right? 
in Europe, for example, often power prices are slightly higher, especially in countries where there's no nuclear power. But in some instances, it's cheap, for example, Scandinavia, because of also hydropower. So that's why Denmark is very popular. But on the one hand, it has this really good connectivity to Europe and therefore have fast internet. But on the other hand, power is reasonably cheap, right? Whereas other regions are slightly more remote, then it's, you know, you probably wouldn't run a power plant in Turkey, uh, sorry, in Turkey as a data center, right? Because it's just too far off in a way, right? But if in the far, further far south, is there anyone in Norway, by the way? Not sure. No, Finland was, right? Uh, oh, that's something. No, that's Sweden, Stockholm, we had already. So no surprise there here. And there's one in Finland here right now on the, on the Google side. Probably Microsoft has some something elsewhere as well. Let's be fair and bring them up as well. But um, those are the main determinants. So uh, performance is a thing. So you need to be wise in suggesting and um, checking your region as well when you actually deploy a machine. Note, once you deploy a machine, actually, you can't really change the region anymore. It's kind of on that data center. The only thing you can do is basically bring it down and then create a new instance in a different data center, right? But again, this is, can be highly automated by scripting. We'll talk about this uh, a bit. Just showing you some regions here. Oh, that's beautiful. Norway East. OK, if we only knew. That looks like Norway West. That looks like Bergen, you know. Uh, availability zone, available, available, re availability zone. OK, when they write availability zone, it basically means there are multiple data centers that uh, mirror the data effectively. So if one goes down, the other one is there, right? You may have, um, did anyone hear of the French data center close to Strasbourg burning down last weekend? By OHC, or that's kind of data center provider. They literally burned down, that was data, like because they didn't have a redundant setup with another data center. They had only that one. That's where the availability zones come in, right? If one data center goes down, data is mirrored on the other one. Generally, not across those regions. That's just to be, you know, too much data transfer possibly and uh, challenging doing it. So, for example, yeah, Microsoft definitely has an instance, two instances in Norway. So, probably because of power prices, right? It's cheap. Actually, surprisingly, no, it's cheap to run that stuff because people costs are high here, but you need very few. You need a lot of power and that's reasonably cheap. Okay. Yeah. So some of the determinants. Anyway, so we learned a bit about the big three. I think I need to, oh God, well over time. Horrible. Looking forward to that evaluation report. Uh, on that note, evaluation, just put comments in like he runs over time or put any other comments in that you might possibly have. I linked the form on the feedback. Please give me something, otherwise in trouble. Um, but um, for today, I want to wrap it up um, here. And I'm not <laughs> didn't quite as far as I wanted, but I wanted to motivate IIS, what services there are, who are the big players, and what are the key determinants actually for you know choosing a player. We haven't sorted that out yet, but at least figuring out why and how they operate in different regions with different zones and different concepts of that kind um, as well, and perhaps learn a bit about their history. Next session, I'm still, I unfortunately, need to continue on this because I didn't get as far as I wanted to. But next session, I will want to end up at uh, introducing to OpenStack. Um, and um, if you actually can try this already, that would be nice homework. Beautiful. Hang on. On the wiki, I provide the slide set after. Uh, yeah, I provide the slide afterwards anyway. But I want to draw your attention to the wiki primarily. Um, there is a link now to additional resources which we're going to use, and they will be relevant for the assignment, so it's worthwhile looking at them. Wiki, uh, under resources, I posted a link to OpenStack here, this entire section, it's a subsection of resources, and basically um, provides a general documentation of Skya or local OpenStack instance. Again, we'll talk about what that means. All we can try already for me is to try and log in whether you can log in. You should be able to, right? And what you use is basically a, your um, NTNU login prefix, not the full email address, then it will not work. So always the, only the beginning part of your NTNU email and your normal password. That's uh, FIDA integrated, FIDA integrated. So it's all straightforward for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. So here's my live going down. Um, but the, so basically, uh, you just need to ensure it's entering new accounts, then you should be able to log in and actually see some, uh, well, at least some sort of project you can deal with. Um, I just want to check that you all guys can kind of sign up so then we can talk about this. So this is an instance that you will be uh, operating with in um, this course. All link from the wiki, also documentation. I will talk more about what you need to look at and the kind of aspects related to and relevant to our course. Good questions. How do you learn 
Uh, from uh, uh, the URL is posted here, like lock in oh, okay. Sky in OpenStack. That's good. Cool. Uh, key thing you need to be in NTU network or VPN. I will not work from home without VPN. Remember that it's written down there. It's also linked to the VPN settings. Remember that if you get a 404 or unreachable or whatever, because in on 404 you get unreachable, uh, then uh, um, check that you are on the VPN. So that's the main point. Anyway, just check the login, nothing else. I just, yeah, else the rest should be assignment. Focus and figure out the assignment. Okay. Um, Susan Tuck for watching, uh, for listening in first place. I know it's a bit of talky talky stuff, but there's still this conceptual business I need to get sorted. Uh, you know, for talk about some cloud technologies, and then we get back to dirty hacking afterwards. Not dirty. All right.